faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resume. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Hey guys, Jared Moon here from Into 3 Fitness, and today on the podcast, we have Julie Morris. Very interesting conversation I had with Julie. It's really how superfoods can make you a better human, and she has a very interesting story of being technically vegan, technically vegetarian, but then, uh, you know, an Oreo, she mentions, is, is a vegan food, but, you know, not really being healthy, and uh, this huge transition that she's had um, over, you know, from college all the way up until today. And uh, we just talk about how superfoods can really help you get back on track, can help you, you know, conquer that low energy or low recovery as an athlete. A lot of things. You've heard me talk a lot about micronutrients. And that's why I wanted to bring someone on the podcast who talks a little bit more about how to implement it, get tactical with micronutrients and, and superfoods and how they can help you. And we even have interesting conversations on medicinal medicinal mushrooms and helping you with your athletic performance. So get out your pen, your paper, take some notes or something somewhere because uh, I absolutely loved this conversation with Julie and I know you will too. So let's get right to it. All right, Julie, I'm super pumped to have you on the podcast today. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Jared. It's so exciting to be here. Yeah, so everybody knows we get started right away with a couple of challenges and a book recommendation. Are you ready for those? Definitely. All right, let's start with a fitness challenge. So I'm going to go ahead and steal this directly from my movement coach, Alex Jamora, who's absolutely brilliant. And he always is telling me that if you hang out in a squat for 30 minutes a day, it will change your life. And I will totally admit, I'm not up to 30 minutes a day. It doesn't have to be completely unbroken. I'm probably like at a solid 15 minutes right now, but it has changed my life truly. It's totally changed my running. It makes me so much more flexible. I just feel better. And I could not agree more. This is such a natural movement that's missing from most of our day-to-day -day lives. So it's absolutely imperative. And I, I absolutely love that challenge. When I used to coach a lot more in person and everything, at the end of every session, uh, depending on how much time we had left, I would make all of my athletes do whatever time was left in the bottom of the squat, whether that was three minutes or five minutes or 15 minutes. Um, and it was always really painful. Uh, not everyone get it the full time, but I completely agree. It's, it's an amazing thing to work on. But that's kind of the exciting thing too, is that I know that when I first had to do it, I was like, this is impossible. Like this cannot be natural, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which is like the worst thing you could say ever. Uh, but it does get a lot easier and, uh, actually a little bit more fun. Right. And in other countries, that's like how they hang out. They're like, you know what? I feel, I feel like chilling. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hop in the squat position. Totally. <laughs> All right. So how about a mental toughness challenge? So mental toughness challenge, this one's kind of interesting. Um, I'm going to go with just the simple act of memorization. And I know that memorization kind of has a bad rap. Most of us assume that it's associated with schoolwork, you know, cramming for tests or like flashcards or something that's just kind of mundane. But I think that memorization is a really powerful challenge because it allows us to A, focus and B, learn how to properly use association, which has so many benefits in our day to day life, you know, be it from like memorizing somebody's name at a party to just incorporating information that you've learned and actually be being able to receive it and go on and utilize it later on. Um, so in terms of training memorization, one trick that I use outside of like, you know, memorizing languages, which I still am terrible at, um, <laughs> what I like to do is, uh, take a list of random words. So I'll go through like a book or an article. It doesn't matter. Just pluck out random words. It can be like chair, shelf, energy, bird, cement, whatever. Just take like 10 or 12 words, write them down, 
and then memorize them. And the trick that I learned to really help out with this memorization is actually from an actor friend of mine. And she told me that a word association is one of the best tools that you can use. So if I'm trying to memorize like, like cloud and then elephant, I may think, okay, well, when I was at the zoo, I saw this elephant and there were lots of clouds around. And it sounds really silly because you're like, well, how is that going to help you? But it does because you have this visualization in your head. Suddenly you have some kind of association that you can connect with on an emotional level. And it helps out tremendously. And before you know it, you've been able to lift to remember this list of completely random words. And, you know, the next day you pick another list. And really what I found this helps out the most in is these kind of small details that I need to remember for my job. And sometimes it's just for a regular conversation. You know, I'm trying to figure out how am I going to remember, you know, how much vitamin C is in this new superfood, blah, blah, blah. It's all through uh, this association technique and it gets so much easier with a little bit of practice. So that's my big mental challenge. I think that's awesome. And so you're primarily u- utilizing uh, your memorization techniques kind of to improve your performance in your work, just like being more knowledgeable and being able to recall things quicker and, and better and clearer. Absolutely. But it also helps in social situations too. I mean, seriously, I'm the, I'm one of those people where like, <laughs> you know, I meet you and I'm so excited to meet you and like shake your hand. And then two seconds later, I've completely forgotten your name. Right. And so having, having, I know your name is Jared. Don't worry. Okay, um, good. <laughs> I was going to quiz you. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been practicing, you know, like, so, so having this little bit of association, you know, if I'm meeting somebody and I'm like, Diana, okay, her name is Diana. Well, my aunt's name is Diana. So now I'm thinking about my aunt. It doesn't matter what that association is. It can be totally random. As long as you put something there to kind of fuse together this otherwise bit of, of random information. So all of a sudden, you know, that like, two days later, you're going to remember this person's name. And I feel like that's like a really exciting little trick. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Something I need to work on for sure, because I know I'm the same way. You know, I meet someone new for the first time. Uh, yeah, you walk away 10 seconds later. I'm like, oh, crap. I, <laughs> yeah, it's like, where, uh, where did it where? go? <laughs> All right. So thank you for that. I think that's awesome. Uh, really cool um, challenge there for mental toughness. Uh, and how about a book recommendation? Well, there's... Gosh, there's a lot that I'm reading right now, but um, a book that I just finished recently was The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. I think his last name is pronounced. I'm sorry, Charles, if I mispronounced your name, but we'll call him Charles Duhigg. Um, it's such a great book. I really loved it. It just really enforces why habits in and of themselves can be so valuable on a day-to-day basis and not just for you know, maintaining a healthy lifestyle, but how they can really clear the path for extra creativity and avoid decision fatigue, which I love. I mean, if there's one or two things less that I have to think about on a day-to-day basis, and that suddenly opens up the door for what's the title of that next chapter that I'm writing in a book going to be, you know, I'll take it. Absolutely. I truly believe like creativity is a finite commodity on a day-to-day basis. And so it's really, really important to protect that as much as possible and creating new habits is a wonderful way to do so. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, I have read that book. That's a great book. Um, I think it's a phenomenal recommendation. Um, Are there any habits that you're working on creating or getting rid of right now? Um, Nothing I'm really trying to get rid of. Um, Probably the biggest habit that I'm trying desperately to create is meditation. And for whatever reason, I've always struggled with keeping that habit ongoing. The best that I've done with it is to push it into a very specific time slot in the morning and before anything else happens so that I really don't have much of an excuse. And, you know, to be fully honest, I still often make excuses like, oh, I'm too tired or, oh, I'm hungry or, whoa, you know, like I I slept in a little bit. But um, that is definitely something that I'm trying to work on. All right. Yeah, I I completely agree. I go in and out of, okay, I 
have a morning routine. I'm doing all these awesome things. And I'm like, well, you know, I don't know if I actually need that. I'm still kind of getting And then I realize, okay, you're actually a much worse person when you're not doing these disciplined habits. And so, yeah, it's, uh, I've, I've been on the roller coaster ride myself, uh, last couple of months on trying to make sure I'm doing the right stuff when I should do it. And I'm like you, the only way it's really going to get done is if it's penciled in at the same time every day and, you know, scheduled really. And one thing that I, that really does help is I make these things called morning lists every morning. And I'm a big, big checklist proponent. I love my checklist. I make them every single day. They're always in tangible form. It's never like on an app or on a computer or anything like that. Like I write it down on a piece of paper, what I want to do that day and also what some bigger goals are. And I find that even if I put in some of these smaller components, like meditate for 10 minutes. Hello. (laughs) It's a lot. It has a lot better chance of actually getting done because I want to cross it off. I want to actually achieve that. So that's been really helpful. That's awesome. Having a little, uh, checklist uh, party at the end of the day or whatever. So you can, you can get things done. You know, there's a lot of psychology behind that. I've been listening to some Jim Rohn stuff talking about writing down every goal, whether massive or small. He's like, he's like, cause the best part of having a list is marking it off, you know, and I, I think that's yeah. so true. If I have to go to the mailbox, I'll put go to the mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I did it. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. All right, Julie, thank you so much for the challenges and the book recommendation. Uh, I would love to help my guests uh, better get to know you, your background, and, and what you're doing now. So take us back really as far as you need to, um, whether that's birth to now or or wherever you, you know you kind of started to develop your passions and superfoods and cooking and all that stuff, uh, wherever you'd like to start? Well, my story really does begin in college. So I won't take you all the way back to birth. I'll, I'll skip a couple of decades. But um, <laughs> I will take you to college when, uh, you know, I was really trying to do the right thing. And I was a vegetarian and I just become a vegan and I still am both of those things, but I, I was kind of going about it the wrong way. I, I thought that being a vegetarian or being a vegan was really about the things you didn't eat as opposed to the things that you were eating. So you can get yourself in a lot of trouble eating quote unquote vegan foods. I mean, like Oreos are vegan, like, right. <laughs> you know, like there's, there's a lot of things out there that you really shouldn't be consuming. And so I was definitely a junk food vegan and, uh, I was, I was going to school for art and design and it was a very, very competitive place. And I was surrounded by people who are thousands of times more brilliant and competent than I was. And so I was working really hard just to kind of keep up. And um, being somebody who is naturally competitive and who's naturally an overachiever, I definitely was working myself into the ground. And I didn't have the nutrition to back up my poor sleeping habits. So I was consuming a lot of energy drinks, <laughs> coffee and Red Bull and just like all kinds of weird carbonated things and just caffeine on caffeine upon caffeine. And then I was eating a lot of sugary foods and I just, I really thought I was invincible and didn't know what I was doing. And after a couple of years of doing this, well, I was about 20 and I started to developed some health problems. Basically, in a nutshell, it was all of the symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome, which is a very nebulous type of situation, type of circumstance. But for me, it was, I was constantly tired. I had horrendous fatigue, like the kind of debilitating fatigue where there's no option in taking a nap, you're going down. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, you know, I had really poor recovery from exercise. My skin was breaking out. I had all these bad food allergies. I, it was just like this wreckage party of symptoms. And, you know, it was really frustrating because I was 20 years old and my body was doing this great job of acting a lot older. Um, one of the other frustrating things about chronic fatigue syndrome is that it's also very difficult to diagnose and it's, it's difficult for doctors to really figure out how to help you in that situation. And so 
when I went to the doctor, it was really more about like, oh, okay, well, these food allergies that you're having are very severe. So just make sure that you take Benadryl and keep that on you at all times. And if you've ever had Benadryl, you know that this is not a lifestyle. Uh, it's, it's pretty terrible. So I was really frustrated and I decided at this point in time that I wanted to kind of take matters into my own hands. And I knew that there had to be something that I could do differently. And so growing up, I had always been this major foodie and like, I literally watched Julia Child cooking shows instead of cartoons when I was five years old and would always go into the kitchen with my mom, helping her make things, loved going to the grocery store, just have always been interested in food. And so I had this idea, <laughs> this crazy idea that maybe there was something I could eat that would give me energy. And which is like sad, really, when you think about it, because like, that's kind of why humans or any animal eats in general. Like that's the purpose of eating is right. energy. <laughs> but for me, this was a novel idea. And so I started to research energy foods. And this is like many, many years ago, over 15 years ago. And so you couldn't just like go down to your local Whole Foods and go to their superfood section. Like none of this existed. So I was looking up online and I, I, I found these things called superfoods. A couple of them I had heard of before, like blueberries and walnuts and things like that. But there was this whole collection of them that I definitely had never heard of before and, you know, didn't even know how to pronounce half of them. And they were from all over the world. And each one had these amazing stories and had been used for thousands of years and had all these medicinal benefits. And I was fascinated. I just thought this was the coolest thing. So I decided on my very meager college budget to get two superfoods just to like test them out, see if they worked. I had nothing to lose. So I got goji berries and I got maca root and I ordered them online and they came <laughs> and I had no idea what to do with them because there's no recipes on this stuff, you know, like there's barely a dosage on how you take these things. So I decided to just kind of throw them into my food processor with like some nut butter and some raisins and whatnot and uh, make like energy balls, just like, which basically means like just mushed up stuff together. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, <laughs> and uh, I decided to do a little experiment. Um, I knew that the caffeine probably wasn't so good for me because I, I was not feeling very good after I was consuming coffee. And frankly, the coffee that I was drinking had lost its effect. So I would drink a cup of coffee and it wouldn't do anything anyways. So I just, my experiment was no caffeine for a month, all about the energy balls. Let's see what happens. And really what I noticed was after a couple of weeks, two things. The first was kind of like, I like not getting the energy high that I was I guess expecting, you know, I was so accustomed to these triple shot espressos and like going through the roof and I have wings and that did not happen at all. So I was a little disappointed initially speaking that all of a sudden I wasn't a superhero by eating these superfoods. But at the same time, I also noticed that I was now no longer having these energy lows. So I wasn't getting like this extreme fatigue in the middle of the day. And I was having a lot more mental clarity and I was feeling a little bit better after I exercised. And all of a sudden, before I knew it, I was starting to feel just balanced in general. And it was the first time in my entire life that I realized that eating something had actually made me feel good, which is bizarre, but so true. I think for so many of us, we get into this position of eating things and having it make us feel bad. And then <laughs> having to deal with that. Most of what we eat all the time is kind of in that category of either like neutral or it made me sleepy or it made me bloated or it gave me a headache or it made me fat or like all these negative things. And here was a circumstance for me where I was like, this made me feel really, really good. This made me feel amazing. And so it just opened up my eyes to the potential around healthy eating and what superfoods could do. 
And it was right around the same time, you know, I, again, I loved cooking and I, all these cookbooks that I had amassed, this whole huge shelf. And I remember just looking at this cookbook shelf and thinking, why are none of these ingredients used in any of these recipes? Cooking has been around for so long and it is so archaic. It is so antiquated. It's still preaching this like butter and bacon and sugar and white flour. And yeah, these things taste amazing, but they're not doing us any favors and we know better. And so I started to become initially curious just for my own sake of how to use these superfoods, how to treat them as foods, as ingredients. And I started to develop recipes for myself and started to share them with people around me and got such positive feedback that I started to look into essentially working with companies who were providing these superfoods and helping them get their recipes out there so that other people in my position could know what to do with these ingredients in the first place. And so my work as a recipe developer and a chef started not to make a pun, but very organically. And it was just, you know, working with really cool companies who had really amazing products. Many times the first time where you'd see this product, even the in the United States and helping them communicate to their customers how to use all these amazing foods. And then I just developed this total passion with it and took it took off from there and I became a bona fide superfood chef which is super random and totally gets me the weird looks at parties still but that's that's genuinely the best definition of what I do I think that's awesome thank you so much for uh you know going in depth there I have a lot of questions and stuff to follow up on uh, but I, I'm curious bringing bringing all the way up to today uh so superfoods are important what are you doing on a daily basis? Like how many meals per day would you say that you're having that has, you know, superfoods in it? Honestly, most. And, but it doesn't, it's not as crazy as it sounds. I'm definitely, I feel like a lot of times people may think that I'm like <laughs> sitting there with like my powders and my jars and my tinctures and just all day <laughs> brewing witchcraft. And it's so not even close to being like that. I mean, my, my, Day always starts with a superfood smoothie. So that's really where I go kind of crazy town on the powders and whatnot. And I change it up every single day uh, based on what I feel like. But, you know, that is definitely a place where there's a lot of alchemy going on. But beyond that, you know, there's so many superfoods which are A, very easy to use and B, everyday ingredients. So things like chia seeds or hemp seeds, like they're so easy to throw on everything. <laughs> so if I'm having a piece of avocado toast, I'll put some hemp seeds on top. Or if I'm having a soup, I'll mix in some chia seeds in there. It's just super, super simple. I also am a huge snacker, especially being a chef and a recipe uh, developer and tester, um, I work with food all day long. So I have to stay relatively, I don't want to say hungry, but not full. I can't get full. Right. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise I don't want to work with food anymore. Otherwise <laughs> nothing sounds delicious. So I usually snack a lot throughout the day and eat a lot of light meals. I'm constantly grazing. So that means that there's a lot of trail mix going on. There are a lot of like little bars and bites of things that I make. And they're a lot like souped up versions of those hideous energy balls that I made the very, very first time. It's just that now they taste a lot better. <laughs> yeah, you refine um, the process. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've worked on it since then. <laughs> and then, um, you know, at, at dinner time and whatnot, I always have a very vegetable rich dinner. So there's lots of greens going on in there. There's lots of cruciferous vegetables, fermented vegetables. And I'm always looking for basically little ways to upgrade whatever it is that I'm making, even if I'm going out to eat, you know, instead of having whatever salad dressing they're throwing on there, I'll just get some olive oil and some lemon and salt and pepper. It tastes delicious. And, you know, that way I avoid maybe questionable ingredients and I get vitamin C from the lemon and I get the monosaturated fats from the olive oil and Go, the list goes on and on. So it's more just kind of this this very organic process of like little upgrades throughout the day. 
I think I definitely want to check out your superfoods smoothies book because I do. I think it would be a super smooth superfood smoothie that I do in the morning right now. Um, but I've been doing the same thing for like a year, and I like need to. I need to mix it up, and I'm not creative at all. I just know all these things are good for me, so it all goes in the one, uh, one big blender. But man, I need to. I need to get some variety in my life. Well, smoothies are one of the easiest ways to incorporate superfoods in general, and they're also one of the most fun because you can create such incredible flavors out of truly natural ingredients without any fillers. So a lot of times, you know, like with baking, for example, how many extra things do you have to put in there just to get that chocolate flavor? There's, you know, the butter and the sugar and the flour and the cream and blah, 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 just to get a chocolate souffle. Obviously, chocolate souffles are delicious. Nobody (laughs) is arguing against that. But with a smoothie, you can get the flavor of a chocolate souffle, except all of a sudden it's made out of some of the most medicinal superfoods on the planet. And you don't, you can uh, completely circumvent all those negative ingredients at the same time. So uh, like the superfood smoothies book is a really fun base for people to start out and see just what kind of potential a smoothie has both in terms of nutrition, as well as in terms of taste. And is there a superfood that you have you said kind of when you started, it wasn't it wasn't this like amazing rebound, but you noticed you got you got a lot more balanced. I think was the word that yeah. you used. Um, is there anything today that you're seeing, like one one particular superfood that you know you want to be a big part of your life or n- have a noticeable change or effect when you are uh, consuming it regularly? Um, well, one of the superfood groups that I've been playing around with in, in I guess the past like year or so more and more is really in the realm of medicinal mushrooms. I think that medicinal mushrooms are our future. (laughs) And uh, I think that there's just so much potential within this class of superfoods that's yet to be tapped into. There's a lot of studies around them as well, which makes them fun to talk about because we actually have a little bit of science to back things up. Um, Of that group, Probably one of my go-to ones right now is cordyceps. And the reason why I like cordyceps is because aside from just helping out the immune system, which everybody can use, they also help with oxygen capacity. So if you like to work out, it's a huge benefit because you'll notice that you just have a little bit more breath in you. And especially if you're doing any type of redlining or uh, some type of endurance sport, I mean, this benefit can be just insurpassable. So I really put cordyceps into like, if I'm having like a morning latte of sorts, if I'm doing any kind of baking or soup recipes, they can be used hot or cold. It's just this little powdered form. You don't need very much of it and it doesn't have that much of a flavor. So it's extremely flexible. And that's definitely something that it's not in my superfood smoothies book, but it was in my most recent book on superfood soups because it was just like, oh my gosh, where has cordyceps been my whole life? <laughs> and I think... Uh, this just brings to mind because uh, the company. Have you heard of the company On It? No. Uh, so that's a. They they're very. Uh, it's a supplement and equipment supplier company. They're based out of Austin, Texas, um, but they have very uh, quality supplements. But one of them, and I think it's very interesting because I wouldn't have known this, uh, and until I tried their supplements, they have a supplement pre workout supplement called Shroom Tech, which I believe the science and everything based behind is what you're saying the cordyceps. Um, they have in this supplement, which I think is uh, really cool because I've never heard anyone ever talk about it. Like you were just talking about that. Um, and so where where do you purchase them, or do you buy it in supplement form, like how I would get the get it from this company on it? Yeah, you 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 buy them in supplement form. So you know most people aren't growing cordyceps in their backyard, and uh, they are relatively difficult to grow. So the easiest way to get them and use them is in a powdered form. And if you have a local market nearby that sells a little bit of superfoods, has a little superfood section, uh, chances are they have some medicinal mushrooms within that selection as well. If you can't find them there, I say just go online. You know, Amazon or any online retailer is going to have it for sure. And that's how I get a lot of my superfood ingredients. 
That's awesome. And do you have a particular, if you don't mind sharing, particular brand that you like if if people were to I order do, online? I do. I love this company. It's called Om Mushrooms, O-M Mushrooms. And uh, what I love about them is I love companies that specialize in what they do. And Om Mushrooms just does mushrooms. They actually grow their own mushrooms in Southern California. They harvest them, they process them, they do everything right there on site. They're, everything is 100% organic and they have all these really great formulas in addition to their single selections. Uh, so they have, you know, you can buy just the cordyceps, you can buy just the chaga or the reishi, or you can get these, these really great formulas that they have, like they have a beauty formula or an immune boosting formula or a fit formula. They even have an energy formula that has a little bit of yerba mate in it and a special blend of mushrooms, which I've been using before workouts. And it's fantastic. <laughs> that thing gets you going. <laughs> That's awesome. And what's funny, what's funny and great about this podcast is, so this, this company, OM Mushrooms, will have, OM Mushrooms will have uh, a, cor- a customer shortly after this podcast is over because I get to talk to all these great guests and then any recommendations they have, any companies they think I should use. Like I'm like a guinea pig throughout this entire process. Anyone who recommends something, just trying to find, uh, you know, a little bit of expertise from each person. And now my day looks like, uh, you know, like 1%, uh, you know, Julie Morris's recommendations, 1% <laughs> someone else's recommendations. Uh, and so it's a lot of fun for me. And that's why I ask specific questions about brand. Cause I know you've already put in the research and the time to find a great brand. So I'd love to, you know, support the same thing. That's really cool. Absolutely. No, I, I really believe in them. And I'm very selective with the, the brands that I work with as well. And there's lots of great brands out there who make mushrooms. But I know Own Mushrooms, personally, I've worked with them for the past couple of years, just, you know, working with their with their mushroom blends in my own recipe testing. And so I know their product line extremely well and have been extremely impressed with it. All right. So I want to go back to chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, cause I think a lot of people, you said it goes undiagnosed, right? And I think a lot of people could probably struggle with this or really if their diet just isn't that great, uh, probably starting to feel or feeling some of the symptoms. And I think, uh, a lot of people go through kind of the, the process of what you said is they, uh, and it sounded like you were eating pretty healthy. So some people are healthy ish compared to, let's say just some Americans would be eating, you know? Um, and so I think, uh, it's really cool to, you know, s- get the recommendations from from you on where where should people take their first step if they are their diet's just crappy and they want to start you know down this path of superfoods. What would you recommend that they do? Well, the first thing that I would really recommend is just an overall mindset. Um, I know a lot of times especially in modern day society, we are absolutely cannonballed by diets and detoxes and lists and lists of no foods. And then you turn on the news and, you know, is cabbage the new cancer causing food? And it's just, it's so ridiculous and it's fear promoting. And I really like to focus instead of all the foods that you shouldn't have or you can't have, rather focus, have an inclusive approach to the, fo- the foods that you should be having. And so I think having that, that mindset of, okay, this week I'm going to start incorporating X superfood into my diet and see how I feel. And, you know, maybe that's like, I'm going to have two bunches of kale per week. That's where I'm going to start. And start to put that into your salad or, you know, if you're making some sort of a main meal like a pasta sauce, you can put it into the pasta sauce, like work it in however you need to work it in, throw it into your sandwich, doesn't matter, your smoothie, work that in, start there. The next week, start with something else new, learn about it, figure out what makes it so beneficial for your body, have some conscientious awareness around what it's doing for you and learn about how to use it. I think it's really a valuable thing when you know 
what it is that the foods that you're eating are actually doing for your body. Not only, you know, is there a little bit of a, a mental stimulus there, but you also start to slowly fade out the things that aren't as good for you because you start taking a mental stock of what everything that you're eating is doing to your body and your system. And when you eat something bad, and you feel bad afterwards, it's disappointing because you know that it can be so much better. So having this inclusive approach, doing that research, you know, going out, you know, listening to podcasts, buying a book, doing research online, whatever it is, wherever you're getting your information, just getting a little bit hungry, so to speak, for living better. I think that was the perfect answer as opposed to, you know, just like, one thing that they should do. And I, I see that happen with diets all the time. Uh, you kind of hit on it there. And earlier is the the exclusion, you know, like what what can't I have? And then you can also get into that really weird, weird realm that you're talking about with, uh, it doesn't matter if it's vegetarian, vegan, paleo, this whole, I'm still following the rules, but I'm, you know, having dessert, you know, three times a day, basically, uh, even though, like you said, Oreos are technically vegan or or whatever. So I think that uh, that's an amazing approach. Uh, and it's it, really, it's a really dangerous uh, situation to be in as well, because let's face it, everybody's different. Whenever, whenever I read a book or hear about a diet that basically says it's my way or the highway, I instinctively know that this, <laughs> this is somebody who's trying to protect their brand and not actually going after the world of wellness as a whole. We are all different. I'm a vegan. I've been a vegan for, oh my gosh, like 17 years, something ridiculous, but it works for me. I know it doesn't work for everybody. <laughs> I do believe that having more plant-based meals does work for everybody, but you know, everybody is going to be a little bit different. So instead of being pigeon-toed into this like tiny little box of a diet and a system that, you know, somebody is saying in their book that's marketed as part of a system and buy their pills and buy their videos and all this <laughs> nonsense, it's better to go out and figure out things that work for you specifically and essentially create your own wellness path. And we can all do that. And the answers are all within ourselves already. It's just through how do you feel? That's it. And one thing I don't think any diet or group or whatever you want to call it would disagree with are vegetables. You know, there's yeah. no one out there saying hey, you might want to stay away from the vegetables or the superfoods like that, <laughs> that's not the best path. And so if anyone is wondering, you know, how to take this the first uh, path towards health, I, you know, I would start with vegetables. Absolutely. All right. So which, which leads me to uh, something I was reading one of your blog posts uh, on your site. Um, and it was about hydration. And you said the golden rules of wellness are eat more vegetables, two, get enough sleep, three, exercise often, and four, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. I was wondering if you could talk about um, hydration a little bit and uh, how you've found that to, to help you when you're more or less hydrated throughout the day. Well, it's pretty bizarre. I mean, so much, so many of us are walking around consistently dehydrated and wondering why we don't feel very good. I mean, just the other day, my, my husband was working with, alongside me and he's like, gosh, I've just felt dehydrated or I felt uh, lightheaded all day. And, uh, I asked him, I'm like, are you getting sick? And he said, no. And I said, well, you probably just need more water. And sure enough, he had a quart of water and then felt much better. And so <laughs> hydration is like one of those very, very simple tasks that we should be doing instinctually and for whatever reason have not. But dehydration leads to so many different health problems. If you look up on the internet, the amount of health problems that are linked to dehydration alone, I mean, it's staggering. You would think that like everything can be cured just through drinking water, which it can't. But I think a lot of those day-to-day -day trivial issues certainly can be, you know, avoiding headaches, having better digestion, having better mental focus, you know, having a better workout, like there's, it just, the list goes on and on. And so taking that really conscientious approach to getting enough water throughout the day is absolutely imperative. Now, that being said, I know that a lot of people do struggle with getting enough water because they quote unquote, don't like water, which 
sounds ridiculous, but I actually do understand it. I mean, water doesn't have any flavor. And so it can seem kind of cumbersome if you're lugging around this big jug all day and, you know, like every eight ounces just feels like a nightmare situation. So I have a few tricks that I actually do to motivate myself to drink more water. And they're all wrapped around this idea of flavor. So a lot of times I will put in um, a little bit of like lemon or lime or some other type of citrus to just give the water a little bit of flavor. Um, one of my favorite tricks is to actually put in a tiny bit of fruit juice, like apple juice or orange juice, citrus juices work really, really well. And then add a little bit of stevia, which is a natural, no calorie, no sugar, no glycemic index sweetener. And believe it or not, the stevia extends the flavor of the citrus and it will make it taste like you're drinking a sweet juice. So everybody loves juice <laughs> and it's most of our dreams to be able to like chug down like 16 ounces of orange juice, even though please don't do that. Like it's way too high in sugar, <laughs> but this is a really great way to kind of marry what your taste buds want and also give your body the hydration that it needs without that sugar impact. That's a great tip. I know I, if I'm not actually tracking or have a water bottle, um, my thought process, and I think a lot of people have the same thought as, you know, I think I'd, I'd probably drink plenty of water, you know, like throughout the day, you just think that, but the, if you were to actually go out and track and I, you know, challenging the listeners here, track how much water you're doing, it's pretty easy. There's like a million apps that could do this. You just entered in, uh, cause I started tracking water and realized, oh, wow, I'm not drinking near enough water each and every single day. And then when I'm not tracking or not thinking about it, I mean, I have no clue. I'm probably drinking a quarter of the amount of water I should each day. So it's something that I know I have to stay on top of if I want to be hydrated. Uh, do you find that, ch that same challenge for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, something that also is very helpful too is if you just do get a quart-sized water bottle and then it's very easy to see, like you need to be drinking at minimum two of those a day. So you fill it up twice <laughs> and it's either gone or it's not. And that's, that's the end of the story. But the crazy thing is, is that by the time you actually feel dehydrated, you're super dehydrated. So if you've ever stood up and felt a little bit lightheaded, that means that your body is in desperate need of water. We should never be getting to that point in time. But, you know, whatever works in terms of, of helping motivate to drink more water and kind of like we were talking about in the beginning, the power of, of habit, getting into that habit, getting into that system of, OK, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to have 16 ounces of water at lunch. I'm going to have 16 ounces of water. By the time we hit five o'clock, I'm going to make sure that I've had at least a quart and a half total throughout the day. So I only have two more glasses before bedtime. And, you know, making that a little bit of a system so that you don't have to think about it quite as much. And on the liquid topic, did you ever reintroduce stimulants or caffeine back into your diet after you kind of took it out? I actually did, believe it or not, which I think surprises a lot of people uh, because <laughs> it comes across as like so anti-coffee and so anti-caffeine. And what I learned, again, like we were talking about, is that everybody is a little bit different. Turns out that I don't have a great reaction to caffeine in general. My body doesn't seem to like it very much. So I keep it at a minimum. I love the taste of coffee. So I definitely don't want to go the rest of my life without ever drinking that again. And decaf just seems silly to me. But uh, right. <laughs> what I do is... <laughs> What I do is, you know, maybe like once or twice a month, I'll just treat myself to some coffee and I won't have any other caffeine throughout the day. And that seems to be absolutely fine. I also use uh, matcha tea a lot. I love matcha. It doesn't seem to have the same effect. It has a very minimal amount of caffeine in it. And that seems to work really well with, with my body. I'm not anti-caffeine. It's more about just being able to get your energy from your own body through the fuel that you put in as opposed to a stimulant, which is just borrowed energy. You have to pay it back at some point. 
Yeah, and that's the the terrible cycle that people get into or stimulants to get revved up in the morning and then depressants at night to get down, whether that's a glass of wine or whatever it is, and this vicious cycle, never actually realizing, just band-aiding over your poor, yeah. poor nutrition uh, without ever throwing in the micronutrients. Um, so I, I do want to ask, has your line of work impacted, I don't know, say the way uh, your husband eats or does things or your family in general? Um, how How has that been? Yes, it definitely has. Um, my husband is German and he came over to the U S about 10 years ago and he absolutely loves pastry and he loves traditional German food. He doesn't drink very much, but everything else is, is all game on. And so when we met, the only healthy thing that he was really doing was he was making a smoothie every day, but he, he was making this total bachelor smoothie. And I think we've all made this smoothie before at some point where you just kind of throw everything that you've ever read about being good for you into the blender and see what happens. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of gray in color and it tastes terrible and you get it down and you're like, I did it. <laughs> so that was his big insurance packet. And, um, I think, since since we've been together, you know, he's really opened up to the world of vegetables more than anything, the world of fresh foods and has really seen that you don't need a lot of the quote unquote traditional ingredients and foods for your recipes to taste absolutely amazing. And he's also gotten really addicted to feeling good after eating. Like when we have dinner, Nobody's sitting there in the chair afterwards rubbing their stomach going, oh my gosh, I never want to eat again. <laughs> I need to lie down. You know, that never happens. It's always a feeling of like, that was great. What are we doing now? There's no fatigue that comes after eating ever. So I think like it's, it's been a very slow moving approach. I've never tried to force anything upon him or anybody for that matter. It's more just like, here are these cool foods, here are these cool methods, and this is what you can, this is what they can do for you. And that approach alone can be very addictive in the best sense. What's your take on, you know, there are a lot of supplements out there, um, micronutrient or greens supplements. What are your, your, your take on those kind of uh, supplements? I think as long as they're made out of real foods, I think they're wonderful. I actually use a lot of the green powders myself. Um, I love juicing, for example, but I often don't have time. And uh, so I will use, especially when I'm traveling, I'll use green powders to just put into my water bottle or to put into a little on-the-go smoothie to kind of get that extra green boost without having to actually bite down into a big salad or have a green juice, et cetera. So I think that as long as they're not watered down with fillers or sugars or you know fake vitamins, artificial ingredients, colors, all that stuff, then it's fantastic. It's at the end of the day, it's food. And so while it may not fill you up in the same sense, it's still gonna be better than nothing and I totally support them. All right, perfect. And uh, last question before we move on to the quick fire questions of the show. Do you mind sharing one of your favorite smoothies with us? Oh my goodness. That's such a hard question. Um, <laughs> or maybe the I, one you had recently. That might work too. Okay. Well, just to backtrack a little bit here. So one of the one of the projects that I'm working on right now, it's brand new. It's, uh, it's called Lumenberry and you can visit it at lumenberry.com. And it's a project that I started. It's very much a passion project that I started with my husband and it's essentially an online superfood education center. And I wanted a place where I could share how to cook with superfoods in a very intimate setting with people beyond just a cookbook. And I'm really, really excited about it. Uh, we just launched it, so it's brand new. You guys are gonna like have the first, <laughs> the first look at it. Um, but we're teaching all of these micro courses because one of the frustrations that I had just on my my own end was in the past when I've when I've taught courses or even when I've like looked at courses online, most people 
don't want to go necessarily to cooking school to learn how to cook with the exception of somebody who wants to actually become a chef. You know, these, these things are very, very intrusive in terms of the time that they take to, to go through. And so you're looking at six months to two years. They're very expensive. And a lot of times they teach things that you may not be interested in learning. So what I wanted to do with superfoods was again, not to make a pun, but like these bite-sized courses where people could just cherry pick the things that they were really interested in learning in the realm of superfoods. And then we could go into detail through a multimedia platform. So there's, you know, videos and tests and information and recipes, et cetera, et cetera. So our first course was actually on smoothies. And I wanted to do a course that was a little bit different from my book, Superfood Smoothies. And so this course was low sugar superfood smoothies. And it's a subject that I think a lot of people are really interested in because so many of us are trying to cut sugar, even natural forms of sugar. And so I really wanted to go into this and see just what we could do with a smoothie and take that flavor level to the nth degree without, you know, sacrificing absolutely anything and without using a lot of fruit or any other types of sweeteners. So my favorite uh, recipe as of late has been this chocolate shake that I make in the course, and it uses frozen cauliflower, which sounds bizarre, but it is so delicious. It's packed with protein. It tastes like this rich chocolate, creamy goodness. And after the course was over, that was just one of those recipes where I'm like, I'm just going to keep making this. I have a ton of frozen cauliflower in the fridge and like, we're just going to keep rolling with this. And so that's really been a huge go-to as of late. And, uh, it just uses so many cool tricks in it too, to keep it low sugar. And you would never know that it was a low sugar smoothie. Wow. So frozen, frozen cauliflower, huh? That's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it does sound I- interesting, but uh, I- I'll, I'll try anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It also sounds like a, an amazing resource. I'm definitely going to check out. Um, and I, I highly recommend all of the listeners check it out too. It sounds super, super cool. But let's head on to the quick fire questions of the show if you're ready. Got it. All right. What's the hardest workout you've ever done? Uh, so we have this idea to like run up these sand dunes in Malibu. And it looked super fun and it didn't look like it was going to be that hard. And, uh, it was, I don't know if you've ever had one of those dreams where you try to fly, (laughs) but it's not very successful and you just kind of like, like just, you're almost like treading water. That's basically what happened with me trying to run up these sand dunes. It was like gravity and the sand was just, everything was working against me and I barely even moved and, I still, I will go back. I will be back at that sand dunes. Like you'll see me again. That's awesome. All right. In your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Uh, slightly biased here because I love it, but I would say long distance running because you go through so many cycles of, I can do this and then I can't do this. And it just builds this complete inner dialogue of working through your fears and your doubts and your aches and your pains. And I feel like almost any challenge in life can be strengthened if you've gone through that process of long distance running. I agree. I know that pushes me. Uh, I'm not an endurance athlete, but I like to get out and do endurance events every once in a while just to get outside my comfort zone. And that's exactly what it does. Totally. And it's really cheap therapy on top of it. <laughs> yeah. All right. If you don't have one piece of equipment to train with, train with for the rest of your life, what would it be? I would have to say a healthy, injury-free body. Awesome. Just that in and of itself. You don't need anything else. I think that's great. All right, the question of the show, what is the best advice you have for becoming a better human? 100% open-ended. Well, <laughs> my instinctual answer to that would be just don't stop trying to become a better human um, in general. <laughs> but um, if we were to drill down a little bit deeper than that, I, I think that there would be two pillars to really living your best life. And the first would be gratitude. And the second would be growth. I think that if you can practice gratitude on a daily basis, you are going to be so much of a happier person and so much of a more successful person. Because at the end of the day, 
the more grateful you are, the less room there is for negativity, for boredom, for anger, for all of those bad emotions that can come in and, you know, sabotage whatever it is that you're working on in your life. So gratitude is absolutely huge. I also think that growth is absolutely paramount. And, you know, there's, there's no reason for having that feeling of gratitude to equal something like complacency. It's more about having gratitude and thankfulness for what you have currently and wanting to do even more and wanting to put out even more. And so, you know, looking for ways to excel on a day-to-day basis from training your brain to adding an extra handful of greens into your smoothie to learning a new language to writing out a the business plan for your dream company. I'm just a big believer in dreaming big and taking action. I think that's awesome. I also like the first answer too. Um, I think they're all great. I know I, I was on a podcast. I was being interviewed on a podcast recently and they knew about how I asked people this question um, and he flipped it on me. And I, I kind of said what you said and I was just like, a lot of people are trying, but everyone needs to try harder and yeah. and, and stop, <laughs> you know, don't stop trying. And I, I just simplified it down to that, which is basically the exact same answer you gave. And I think that's uh, at the beginning, but gratitude and growth, 100% in agreement with that too. I think that's awesome. So I, I'm sure a lot of people are going to want to check out your books and all the stuff that you have going on. So what's the best place for people to learn more about you and what you have going on? Well, you can find me personally on my website at juliemorris.net. And you can find out all the new stuff that I have coming out at luminberry.com. And that's L U M I N berry as in berry.com. And, uh, you can also find me on Instagram at superfood jewels. All right, perfect. And I will link to all of those things in the show notes. Julie, it's been a blast having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Jared. always whine about their best. <laughs>